So, high powered e bikes and the question of legality. This is a very complex subject, and these are my opinions. And if you think I'm nuts, then so be it. I mean, I ride my bike in minus 20 and below, so that actually might be a fair assessment. Uh, if you don't agree with me, that's cool. Feel free to set me straight. Just please do it in a friendly and constructive way. I didn't really want to get into the legality aspect of my electric bike hobby, at least not yet. But then I watched Andy Kirby's video and it turned out that someone had reported one of his videos to the police. So it kind of got me thinking that it could easily happen to me no matter how carefully and safely I try to ride. So I thought I would set out some of my thoughts on the current e-bike laws where I live. Because as it stands, there's no way of getting around the fact that I'm breaking the law where I live by riding my e-bikes on the road to do commuting at the power levels that I'm running. So let's start by taking a look at the laws where I live. The law in British Columbia classifies an e-bike as a motor assisted cycle. Let's look at the information at the Insurance Corporation of British Columbia, ICBC, which for anyone who doesn't live in BC is a governmental monopoly that's best known for supplying motor vehicle insurance at astronomical rates, as in almost double the amount I've paid anywhere in Canada and I've lived in four provinces now. I was able to insure two vehicles in Ontario for less money than one vehicle in BC. And apparently, it's the same country. ICBC classifies e-bikes as MAC or motor assisted vehicles. You can tell by that phrasing that the people that crafted this piece of legislation have never been within 100 meters of an actual e-bike. It's like asking a nun to make you a top-notch Long Island iced tea. It's just not going to happen. I mean, look at the pictures they have to illustrate the category. I've seen tons of e-bikes and they look nothing like that. To qualify as an MAC, certain conditions must be met. For example, the electric motor must be 500 watts or less and be capable of propelling the cycle no faster than 32 kilometers an hour on level ground without pedaling. Like, 32? I mean, limits are usually in increments of 10, so 32 makes zero sense to me. The vehicle must be equipped with a mechanism that either allows the driver to turn the motor on and off, or prevents the motor from turning or engaging before the MAC or MAC attains a speed of three kilometers an hour. The motor must disengage when the operator stops pedaling or releases the accelerator or applies a brake. Standard stuff, really. The motor cannot be gas powered, so I guess those two stroke kits are out. The motor must be capable of being propelled by muscular power using the pedals, but it is not necessary to always be pedaling. So I guess at least I can use a throttle. And I'm sure that I heard parts of Europe are 250 watts and no throttle and I thought the Europeans would be more liberal. Anyway, I am sure that this was not written by someone who actually rides an e-bike or who has any appreciation for the potential of light electric vehicles in general. So in the interest of science, I crippled my fat boy by limiting it to 500 watts. And this is the result. As you can see, 500 watts is not much to move a fat bike on the flat, never mind uphill. It certainly isn't going to threaten the 32 kilometers an hour speed limit without a hurricane of a tailwind or a very light rider. In hilly town though, you can get 32 kilometers an hour downhill with a kid's three-wheeler. It would be insanely dangerous, 
but totally legal. They make the suggestion even that there could be a mechanism that prevents the motor from engaging until three kilometers an hour is achieved. So if you came to a stop on a 10% hill, which is super common in my town, if I was unfortunate enough to have a bike that complied with the law in this way, I would be unable to use my throttle to get the bike moving. So what is safer for a cyclist? To have them stand on the pedals and crank away to shift the bike, swaying about to get moving, or a quick twist on the throttle to start the bike from a standstill? Which is better for a car driver? Is it the object moving in a smooth, controlled manner, in a predictable direction, or a struggling, sweating object cursing and wobbling from side to side? E-bikers are expected to follow all the rules of the road, yet we are being crippled by a separate and outdated set of laws, laws that make us unsafe to ourselves and unsafe to other road users. It's almost criminal that these laws cripple clean and efficient means of transport in a time when there is a desperate need to develop and utilise such systems. To illustrate a point, let's take a look at cars, because like most e-bike users, I also drive and have done for over 25 years. Let's say we're in the market for a new motor. I pop down the dealers and start chatting with the salesman, and he tells me that due to changes in the law, the maximum speed of all the cars on his lot is 100 kilometers an hour, and the motor sizes have been restricted to a maximum of one liter. Not only this, but it's the same for all categories of vehicle. So a 4x4 truck or SUV has the same maximum size of engine as a micro two-seater car. I would bet my house that the vast majority of people would not only be outraged at this oppressive policy, they would be outside Parliament in their millions having the world's biggest protest. Yet far worse than this is being done to e-bikes and virtually every other light electric vehicle the world over. The only vehicles that are exempt, funnily enough, are electric vehicles that replicate the current car system. Which I think is absolutely mental when I think about it. We are faced with a huge crisis in terms of pollution the world over, and we need to achieve something truly monumental in order to solve these issues. I feel that light electric vehicles are essential in order to retain our mobility in a less resource intensive manner. The most commonly used cell in electric vehicles is the 18650 battery. The bigger and heavier the vehicle and the longer the range required, the more batteries that are needed. The most popular battery pack supplied by Tesla contains 7104 18650 cells. My bike uses a pack with 126 cells. It gets me about town just as efficiently as a Tesla and in heavy traffic during rush hour or construction areas much, much more efficiently. It can go places a Tesla simply can't. With the correct trailer, it can also pull a ton of cargo. So effectively, we could be moving 56 people on e-bikes or similar weight electric vehicles for roughly the same material cost as one Tesla. Then consider that a recharging grid for light electric vehicles would require much simpler infrastructure and could utilize the power as it is delivered right now without the need for expensive fast chargers. Solar and wind to recharge become much more viable if you're charging 100 cells rather than 7,000 odd cells. Every cafe or shop could have recharging points for light electric vehicles. As they take up less room, you could get in more charging points and service more customers. Now say you don't like e-bikes or don't feel safe on one. How about a light buggy or a trike? All of these vehicles can get people where they need to go safely and with much less resources and material cost than cars and trucks. Huge companies like Bosch are making these underpowered motors that are so narrow in scope just so they can meet archaic laws that have zero basis in the reality, which is people want to move efficiently and safely in comfort. This kind of revolution could transform the urban environment if implemented with some thought and planning, but it's not gonna happen if we're crippled by these laws that are not keeping up with the modern world. 
Another side effect of having underpowered e-bikes is that they are being pushed onto shared paths and even the regular sidewalk. I see them on sidewalks all the time where I live and the reason is that people feel safe there. The power levels are such that they are not much better than a regular pedal bike in the hands of an even half fit person. I used to ride on the pavement all the time as a bike user, especially in very busy areas. And I don't do it with my high powered e-bikes for the reason that I can keep up with the flow of traffic. The hazards to a cyclist riding in with cars are numerous. They include punctures from the debris that appears at the side of the road, wheel damage from the poor road surface at the sides of roads, more puddles and standing water to navigate in the event of rain and storms, having to navigate past car doors that can be opened in front of them, having car after car after car pass them. Not every car driver is patient. Some of them can be quite rude if they're stuck and have to wait for a few seconds. Even if the car drivers are respectful, larger vehicles can cause danger from turbulence as they pass next to cyclists. These are just some of the obstacles that push people onto paths, all of which can be eliminated simply by being able to keep up with traffic with an e-bike that has a bit of power. This is less of a problem in areas where there are dedicated cycle networks, but sadly, in much of North America, such networks are just a dream and cyclists and e-bikers must mix with traffic. So how would I do it differently? I'd start by creating a proper light electric vehicle class that would encompass all forms of light electric vehicle with realistic and sensible laws governing their use. I'd keep a separate code for e-bikes, but employ a power to weight ratio for wattage to ensure that a useful and fair level of performance is possible for all users. Not have this madness where a heavy fat bike pulling a trailer can only have the same power as a carbon road bike. Potentially, the use of a light electric vehicle over say 1500 watts would require a test to demonstrate that the user has enough skill and knowledge in its safe operation. It would also have to meet minimum safety requirements regarding things like the materials used in frames, mechanical components, tires, signals, and brakes. Being able to buy insurance and have it actually be affordable and take into account the benefits that moving to this type of transport can have for society and the urban environment in particular. I wanna get something straight. I have driven cars for over 25 years and I have nothing against them. But if we could use them for longer journeys and lighter electric vehicles around towns and cities, then I think we would start to see huge benefits, particularly in air quality. I could probably go on and on and on about how the urban system could be transformed using light EVs, but I think that's probably for another video. So to summarize, at the end of the day, I'm not riding illegally because I want to, and I'm not riding illegally because I think it's cool. I'm doing it because it's very difficult to be either safe or efficient without doing so. I'm doing it because I think it's critical to the future of our society to develop and use light EVs. I think we need a fair framework to work in that is not based on some pencil pusher who has never ridden an e-bike in their entire life. We need realistic power levels and help and assistance to ensure that the bikes we make and sell meet a minimum standard for safety. We need a framework so new vehicles in this class can be quickly developed and utilized. I really think we're on the cusp of something quite special with light EVs. If we as a society are going to meet the huge challenges we face, we need these efficient vehicles and we need them to be enabled and not held back. So I'm gonna to continue to develop my electric vehicles and challenge this crazy situation. I'm inspired by all the other people out there also working on light electric vehicles. And I hope that by demonstrating how safe, efficient and essential these vehicles can be, that the laws will be changed. Feel free to comment on this and make suggestions and add to this conversation. These are just my opinions and you might feel I should obey the law and toe the line. But ask yourself this, when in history has anything been changed by towing the line and keeping to the status quo? Cheers.